All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's HFES Equality, Diversity and Inclusion webinar, the first of our series entitled Listening and Acting. My name is Alexis Kolak and I'm the Education Senior Manager for HFES. I'm pleased to be your host for today's webinar. Before I turn things over to our moderator and panelists, I'd just like to cover a few quick housekeeping items. All of our attendees will be on mute for the duration of today's broadcast. If you do have questions for our panelists or for our moderator, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom toolbar to submit those questions. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the duration of today's broadcast, but we'll be holding those questions until the end of today's session in order to allow our presenters to give you their full thoughts and information and to allow the process to flow as some of your questions may evolve as we move through today's broadcast. We're reserving approximately 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of today's session, but we'll do our best to answer all questions. And if we're not able to address your question during today's broadcast, we will share those with our moderator and panelists after today's dialogue. A recording of today's webinar will be available on the HFES website following the broadcast, and you will be able to see that in the member forum once it is available, in case you need to share this with coworkers, uh, other individuals within your organization or network or close family and friends if this is what you like to do together on your evening game nights. And with that, the last note I'll say is if you do have any technical difficulties during today's broadcast, you can also enter that as part of the Q&A. Um, the chat function is reserved at this time for our panelists. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Miriam Zahabi, who is our moderator for today, to welcome you and introduce our panelists. Miriam. Thank you, Alexis. Welcome to uh, the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society webinar on equality, diversity, and inclusion, listening, and acting. My name is Mariam Zahabi. I'm an assistant professor of industrial and systems engineering at Texas A&M University, and I'm moderating this session today. We have three great panelists today, including Dr. Carolyn Sumerich. She is an associate professor in the Department of Integrated Systems Engineering at The Ohio State University. She is currently serves as the chair of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Our second presenter is Dr. Rod Roscoe. He is an associate professor of human systems engineering at Arizona State University and chair of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society Social Impact Committee. He is passionate about advocacy for inclusion and equity and re recently co-edited a volume on advancing diversity, inclusion, and social justice through human systems engineering. Our third speaker is Dr. Jay Jones. Uh, he is a civil rights lawyer and social scientist who has worked as a diversity and inclusion consultant and advocate for over 25 years. He is a recognized diversity and inclusion strategies advocate and expert who has contributed to many publications and served on education panels worldwide. We would like to welcome all our panelists, and uh, then uh, we are going to start from Dr. Sumerich to ask about her thoughts and about uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you to Farzan and Miriam uh, for hosting this webinar. I'm really honored to be uh, presenting uh, and I will be speaking a bit here at the beginning, uh, but then I'm going to be listening a lot. So we were presented with three questions to address during this webinar. Um, the first one, uh, as an inclusion and diversity activist, what are your overall thoughts on the recent events? And I tend not to think of myself as an activist, but I think everybody this day needs to become one. That's not my answer to this. Um, my answer is that um, the first 12 years of my life was a very violent time, full of upheaval and tragedy in this country. And it was also a time of protest, as it is today, um, and a time when important legislation uh, that was intended to make systematic change uh, came about with the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act. Today, we're also in a very dark period of our country uh, with, with 
tragedies unfolding for the families of all of these men and women and many more who've been uh, killed uh, by police. What this does is it makes me very sad, it makes me frustrated, and it makes me very disappointed because I believe our country really should be better than this. And it also makes me recognize that I need to learn more and I really do need to do more. And that is in my professional life and in my personal life. And so part of that is the activity um, of participating in this webinar and listening to what our members um, uh, expect from us and what they um, would like to contribute. Question number two, how would you challenge the HFES membership to contribute to, the, to making things better? And how can HFES members contribute professionally to some solutions? Kind of address these in kind of the opposite order there. First, I wanted to give you a little bit of inspiration and ideas about what people in our society have been doing. I went and looked back at the um, conference proceedings um, and stretching back even as far as 1994, uh, Smith and Carrion were talking to us about considering communities as dynamic systems. And when you do that, then human factors and our approaches like micro uh, ergonomics and, and thinking of um, considering socio-technical systems, uh, those are appropriate approaches for addressing uh, problems that communities experience and working with them to develop solutions. Uh, that's similar to uh, Newman, uh, Newman's presentation in 2002, Macro Ergonomics and Diversity. Uh, she says uh, it very aptly in the first sentence of the abstract. Macro Ergonomics provides a systems approach to solving complex problems. And that's certainly what, what we what we deal with when we're talking about healthcare, education, and the workforce. Uh, in 2002, again, Carry On is looking at um, community issues here in particular with um, issues of retention uh, of women and minorities in the IT workforce, which we know is, is still uh, an issue and a challenge today. Further, we have a presentation by Sanders, who was looking at using human factors approaches to designing courses that would help to encourage retention of engineering students and specifically students from, uh, who, from groups that are um, historically underrepresented in engineering and other um, STEM fields. And then the last two uh, presentations on this slide uh, are uh, addressing uh, the need for and the value of applying human factors approaches to cultural disparities in healthcare. And then of course, um, we have this wonderful uh, edited book by Rod and Aaron and Abby, which came out a couple of years ago, and Rod's gonna talk more about this, uh, in his presentation. And so the other part of the question was, uh, how would you challenge HFES membership to contribute to make things better? So here are just very few ideas. Number one, I think educate yourself. Learn what you don't know about systemic racism. If you don't know what Black Lives Matter means, if you don't know what um, white privilege means, Look it up. We, we do research on all kinds of topics. So this one is, is vitally important. And um, I appreciate Camille in the forum talking about the need um, to, to do this. When we talk about our groups within HFES, our technical groups, our communities, and or our committees, and now our affinity groups, these groups help to shape our annual meeting. And so consider, you know, what content is being presented, if you have any influence in those groups. Um, and if you are developing panels, obviously those panels should be diverse. 
um, that really became a point of uh, uh, heightened uh, awareness after our 2016 conference. Uh, as far as our leadership goes, for example, in our technical groups, we have a number of positions in each of those groups. And does the leadership reflect the diversity of the TG's membership? So make a plan and execute that plan to engage and retain members and, and mentor them and encourage them and nominate them and vote them into leadership positions. That's good for, for them and it's good for the TG and it's good for the society. Educators and researchers, who are you engaging in your research as co-investigators, as research participants, in your advisory boards? Who are you mentoring? How inclusive is your classroom? Whose research are you introducing your students to and what are the topics? And then we give a lot of awards out in our society. We recognize people um, for their contributions to our society and to the larger society. And we recognize their, um, we recognize them in terms of their accomplishments uh, at uh, the uh, level of fellow. So think about who you're encouraging to become a fellow or who are you nominating or mentoring um, in this area. Uh, sometimes people are reluctant to put themselves up for uh, these kinds of awards or recognition. Uh, and it may be up to us to encourage that. And there are many more ideas that were being posted on the forum. Please continue to share your ideas. Our third question. How do you see HFVS doing well? Uh, or what do you see and how could HFVS improve? So policy and structure, uh, we have two very relevant goals uh, in our strategic plan. One of them uh, focusing on addressing societal problems, uh, emerging societal problems, and the other specifically addressing diversity uh, within the society. We also have, uh, have had for many years a diversity task force, uh, which was elevated to uh, become a committee, a permanent committee in 2016. And that is now an executive council level committee, which indicates the importance of that committee. Uh, we have a societal impact committee, which Rod uh, chairs. In our student chapter awards, we recognize our student chapters for addressing and furthering the mission of diversity and inclusion. We have a membership committee that has uh, as one of its charges to specifically target practitioners and target uh, improvement in diversity and um, to specifically have activities that address those um, target goals. And recently we have uh, uh, started to uh, 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 develop and encourage affinity groups. So many of you are probably familiar with the women's group. That's one of our affinity groups. Uh, but we also have uh, two others uh, at this point in time. And, and um, there are opportunities for other um, people to um, come together in a sense of community that um, is maybe somewhat different from the technical groups where you have, you share a technical interest here, um, you share other types of mutual interests uh, in, in our affinity groups. Activities. So we have done membership assessment um, from time to time to understand not only who our members are, but what their concerns are. We do um, basically climate assessment periodically. That is now being built in to the assessments that we do regularly with the um, annual meeting survey and other um, opportunities to get information from people who participate in activities. So we're building that in instead of making that something that we just do every five years. Annual meeting program is something that um, the diversity and inclusion committee is actively engaged in, but we've also um, had other types of programming rel relevant to diversity and inclusion. 
Uh, we remember when Ron Davis was a presenter when Nancy Cook uh, was uh, the uh, president of the society. This particular webinar is part of this new Listen and Action webinar series. Uh, we are also going to be uh, initiating a diversity and inclusion community uh, forum series, uh, which is kind of stepping off from the uh, elephant in the room that Chris so bravely uh, initiated uh, for us. In government affairs, Micah uh, has been active in that for a long time, but in particular, um, they're working right now on informing uh, law enforcement reform legislation. And we are also planning to do a 360 degree review of HFES with regards to diversity and inclusion. Uh, there, what's missing? So what have we not done so well? What do we need to do? Well, we don't have a diversity inclusion statement. Uh, there's a draft of it that I came across from 2017, but it's um, not anywhere on our website and neither is very much at all really about diversity and inclusion on our website. So lack of visibility is really um, uh, an issue that we're going to be addressing. And so I want to say that HFES is a work in progress as are we all and is uh, our society as well. And again, I appreciate being able to participate uh, in this webinar. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Rod. Thank you, Carolyn. So I'm very happy to be part of this webinar today and to share some screen time with some really great uh, panelists and to talk about some of the issues that we are facing as a society, um, both a society HFES, but also society, the world at large. I am Rod Roscoe, Associate Professor of Human Systems Engineering at ASU, and also, as mentioned, the chair of the HFES Societal Impact Committee. And you'll see that I get to uh, echo some of what Carolyn said and, and boost these messages. Um, the first question that we were all asked again was sort of what were our overall thoughts and to what's to recent events. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, and my personal experience was anguish, um, fear, um, hypervigilance. So I'm, I'm sort of a compulsive news checker, even though the news is hurting me, I still need to know what's going on um, and a lot more. So there's a lot of complex feelings coming at me from every direction. But one thing that I am not feeling is surprise about what's going on, that um, there's police violence and that people are dying because um, this is not a new problem by any stretch of the imagination. Um, showing a photo now of uh, four women who are united in the fact that they've lost their children to police violence. So Geneva, Sabrina, Gwen, and Valerie here um, have all lost their children. And Valerie says, it's been a long time that we've been struggling as a people. So this is not new. This is not surprising to me. I'm not going to read this whole quote, but this is from the a Guardian article about some of the recent protests. And they interviewed some of these mothers about their thoughts. And these mothers, like I said, are unified in their experience. Um, 1999, 2006, 2012 um, are when some of these cases happened. Um, and their comments on what's happening now is there's no change. If anything, it got worse. So these are not new. This is not surprising. What is new, though, is that we have cell phone footage. We have evidence. It's not just eyewitness testimony. He said, she said, they said, and then a file disappears into a police drawer. We have the videos. And that is encouraging. Um, also encouraging to me is this the movement that has started and the protests um, and there's a lot of activity. This webinar is evidence of that. But my fear is that the next catastrophe and there will be another big event is going to steal focus, right? We are going to have a climate change. We are going to have more political drama. We're going to have stuff. We're already going through stuff. We're living in a global pandemic. And I worry that topics like racism and sexism will fall by the wayside yet again. And what I like to remind people is that there's no catastrophe that's coming 
where racism and these other anti-humanist ideologies won't play a role. Um, so as long as we, if we can maintain focus on these issues, we'll be better prepared to handle any catastrophe that comes along. So that's how I'm feeling right now. Um, the second question was, what can we do to make things better um, or to contribute to solutions? And in order to answer that question, I needed to pose a different question, which is what are our problems? Um, what are the problems that a human factors or ergonomics expert can contribute to solving? Because I think it's really tempting to look at these societal level problems like racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, the pandemic, police violence, and relegate them to other disciplines. Like, well, that's a psychology problem. That's a sociology problem. That is an epidemiology or medical problem. That's a criminology problem, but they're not ours. They're not something that we can play a role in. And I don't agree. I actually think very few of these problems are out of scope for us. To make this point really clear, let's talk about engineered systems. For example, American slavery and segregation. These are often referred to as like historical eras, like the period of slavery or segregation. But these were not systems that just happened. They were, they were designed. Slavery was a transoceanic industry with things like inventory or shipping and logistics, advertising. Yes, there were, there were advertisements. Um, none of that happens by accident. That's all design. That's all engineering. And then you think, okay, well, slavery was abolished. But even at that moment in time, the 13th Amendment contained on purpose an exemption for labor for incarcerated people. So if you were in jail, you could still be made to work for free or you face punishment. And right on the heels of that were the Black Codes and Vagrancy Laws, which made it easier then to incarcerate uh, Black people. So you were free for about half a second but now you were walking down the street being suspicious and they didn't have cell phones back then, but you know, we'll imagine they call the cell phone. Now you're in jail and you're back into being slave labor. And this didn't just happen one time, but again and again and again. These are engineered systems. They are not natural systems. So I ask, who understands engineered systems? These are engineered. Someone had to design things, plan the laws, implement them, test them, refine them, reinforce them, all through deliberate action. So I ask, do any of you watching right now know of a collective of expert practitioners and scholars who are adept at analyzing and solving problems within these kinds of complex engineered systems? Who? Do we know anybody who can do that? <laughs> uh, so I think the answer is pretty obvious. And as mentioned earlier, we wrote a book, we mean being Aaron Shu, Abby Woldridge and myself um, on exactly these kind of ideas. So we really wanted to take the work that again, Carolyn mentioned has been going on in HFES for a while and provide a venue or a platform for talking about it. Let's, let's reify it, let's make it into a book. Um, and so can we draw on HFE theories to evaluate, understand social threats um, to inclusion and justice? Can we draw on our expertise to recommend actionable strategies for research, training, design um, within marginalized or vulnerable populations or to help marginalized or vulnerable, vulnerable populations? So that was the book that we, that we generated. We did not, I wanna say we, break new, we broke new ground here because this work has been going on, but we wanted to give it another platform um, and one of the chapters comes from Ellen Bass, who writes a personal narrative about confronting sort of personal discrimination, confronting a system of discrimination, and wrote, to address these multifaceted and multi-level problems, I reached into the human factors and systems engineering toolbox, starting with a stakeholder analysis. And I really like that, that terminology and that, that framework of thinking of us, what tools do we have? We have a toolbox, we have a toolkit, we have a whole workshop. We're a very diverse discipline and there's a lot going on. And so some of the chapters that I'm gonna highlight in a second um, show how we can use these familiar tools but apply them to social justice issues. So one section of the book talks about supporting healthy communities. And we have a chapter um, by Jacqueline Stonewall and colleagues um, who talk about doing data-driven decision support 
to address the needs of people in economically and culturally marginalized areas. And they draw upon human behavior data, um, various modeling approaches, data visualization, all tools that many of us are familiar with, um, but directed towards um, uh, culturally marginalized people and populations. They also get bonus points for addressing climate change. Thank you. Another example comes from Natalie Benda and colleagues um, who show us how work domain analysis can advocate for social justice. So very detailed analyses of emergency healthcare um, with people with limited English proficiency or how to improve housing access. So again, a familiar tool, a powerful tool applied to a social justice question. Another section of the book discusses empowering diverse people. And so we have a chapter by Williams and Gilbert that talks about participatory design and challenges us to rethink how a, a method that we tend to assume is inclusive can be exclusive, um, that can actually take power away from people. Um, and so really does a great job arguing how we need to be thinking of justice throughout you know, the entire design process. Another chapter um, comes from some of our international colleagues. Um, so Jordan Rodriguez and colleagues um, did an ergonomic analysis of recycler communities working in Medellin, Colombia, and looking at the vulnerabilities they face in terms of income, health care, illness, um, and you know, other ergonomic threats and, and life threats. Um, what's great about this chapter is the image that you see was commissioned by the authors to really showcase who they were talking about. Not an abstract, but this powerful moving drawing. And we loved it so much, we asked if we could use it for the cover of the book, and they said yes. And so that's where the cover image came from. And then one last example comes from Marita Harris and colleagues um, who talk about um, older adults who are themselves a marginalized population. And they remind us that there's diversity within that diversity, such as education, disability status, living situation, and more. But again, they draw on techniques and methods that are familiar to us. Needs assessment, interviews, heuristic evaluations, field trials. These are you know, our bread and butter and we can use them to think about how to make people's lives better. In this case, design technology for older adults. So this is just a sampling of, of chapters. We actually have 18 really great chapters um, and a foreword from Tanya Smith Jackson that is just phenomenal. Um, and I didn't even get to talk about the third section on strategies for an inclusive future. Um, so I encourage people to check out the table of contents in the preface. Um, I'm happy to share chapters or maybe you want to buy the book. I don't know. Um, so with that, let me move on to the third question, which is um, what, do you, what are we doing well and how can we improve? Um, in terms of what we're doing well, I think that we clearly have the ability to embrace these societal problems as our kind of problems. And we have the toolkit, the intellectual toolkit, the methodological toolkit um, to do this we have the expertise. And so the book and some of the work that Carolyn mentioned is proof of concept that we can be um, a quote, activist organization, making the world a better place um, in some addressing some of these societal problems. There are some needs, or I guess I can say opportunities for HFES. One opportunity that we have is to make the choice to embrace these problems as ours which is really an issue of will, not skill. We can do it, but are we going to choose to do it? We also have the opportunity to, to listen and learn about more equitable approaches. So we have our favorite methods, we have our favorite theories. How, how can we elaborate on those? What ideas are we missing that we can bring into our work to have this positive impact? We also have the opportunity, I think, which is really important and part of our strategic plan that Carolyn mentioned to build bridges with other organizations. As many skills and as much knowledge as that we have, we're not all things to all people. And by reaching out to other societies and other um, you know, practitioner groups and other pools of knowledge, we can enrich our own work. We don't have to do it all by ourselves. And I think Jay represents um, the next speaker um, a great example of that. We also have the need to recognize and confront the principles that define these anti-humanist ide ideologies. You know, what is a racist ideology? What is a sexist ideology? And we need to confront those. We cannot be silent 
And that, that includes addressing the spokespeople, that when people are advancing these ideas, we need to challenge the people who are, who are the, the proponents. We have to learn the way they, they frame these arguments, the psychological tactics they use to insert these ideas into a dialogue and defend them and be ready because it will be a fight. The last thing I wanna say is we have an opportunity to be more inclusive and intersectional. We're talking about race, that's sort of like uh, the thing that, that started this, but I've mentioned sexism, homophobia, there's so many issues, but they're all unified by an underlying anti-humanist ideology that um, some people are worth more than others. That's where all of these isms and phobiums, phobias come from. And so we're gonna fight individual fights, but really there are a lot of messages with, this, with a common theme. So I'm happy to kind of like reshare the same sort of image that Carolyn finished with, just to really hit it home, um, that all of these things are true, they're all important, and we, we have a role in, in playing to contribute to all of them. Uh, so thank you very much. And now I will turn it over to Jay. Good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Rod and Carolyn. Uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, when I received this uh, invitation to be here, I, I was very appreciative and I am still. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, by the work that you all are doing. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that what I brought to the table here would be something that is within my own uh, realm of, of expertise that actually could add to yours or that I could learn from you uh, and, and we learn from each other. So uh, basically what uh, I looked at all the things that have been presented already. Um, and when I, when I presented these slides or handed off these slides, I thought that this would be more of a Q&A uh, session. However, uh, it seems to be flowing pretty well. The, so I chose the title Advocacy Versus Comfort uh, for my slides. And the reason I did that is because we hear a lot of times when we talk about diversity conversations, the first thing people talk about is how uncomfortable they are doing so. Um, so I wanted to talk about the, I wanted to talk about the contrast between being comfortable and being able to advocate on behalf of those who trust and trust in you to do so, to be able to advocate for them. How, the first question I wanna ask is how can you do that if you are uncomfortable finding out and discussing the truth about what the situation is. So I'll leave that there. Uh, so first, I, I did want to say uh, conversations about race and ethnicity are never comfortable. If they are comfortable, if they were comfortable, then we wouldn't have a need for diversity and inclusion to be a pointed out subject or uh, per, part of each organization. So the first thing I want to say is, is get comfortable being uncomfortable. So we, in order to have the discussion. The other thing I'll say is, please understand that when I, when I give uh, information, whether it's fact or opinion, it is based on my own experiences, the things that I hear, the things that I learn. And a lot of times those things are not the popular beliefs. So that's another thing that I want you to, to understand that not that data, there, there is sometimes a skew in data based on the fact that it, it does represent the majority most of the time. And what we're talking about here is problems that affect the minority. Um, so I wanted to uh, answer the first question that we were asked, which is what, are our, what were our overall thoughts on recent events? Uh, and my actual thought is that it's, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, watching and listening. Uh, and now it is time to take action. I believe that all the times before now, action should have been taken. So I'm taking the, I'm coming from the lens of why have things not changed and why are we still asking for very basic uh, rights um, in 2020? Um, and uh, I want to conceptualize our approach that we are better than this as a nation. And what, so what we have to understand is that uh, what I have here is that uh, capitalism, which is what we have in our, in our country, requires creating and maintaining a status quo. Uh, and what that means is there has to be, there have to be classes of people to include those who are oppressed or poor, those who work for basically nothing, and those who have a lot 
or a lot more than what they need. Uh, and if you think about that in terms of racism, uh, it's identical. Like, uh, like Rod said, you have a group that, is, that has to feel superior to another group. And we wanna look at that in terms of wealth and economics, okay? So we have a history of systemic racism in our, in our country. And what that means is that our political system, our governmental system has all been designed to ensure that things remain the way they began, the way they started. Um, so Rod gave us the information about how slavery began. It was an actual system um, designed with inventory, uh, structure, everything. That was how this country was built and that was put in place to be the way this country is run. So as social, uh, as people became more social and people started to believe when religion was introduced, um, they started to, and again, the country was founded on religious freedom, uh, moving from one place of, of religious, religious prosecution to another. Then morality came into play while we had slavery. And one group said, okay, well, we don't, we don't need slavery because it's a moral idea. The other group didn't believe in slavery because it was an economic idea. Uh, however, when the Union and the Confederacy were separated, there had to be some way of the Union getting an advantage over the Confederacy. So the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation, though a lot of us celebrated as, oh, it freed the slaves. It was actually an idea to be able to take away uh, an economic advantage from the Confederacy uh, and to stifle their progress by freeing slaves and offering those freed slaves the opportunity to come fight for the, for the Union Army. So that's where slavery is. And then we're talking about constitutional ideology of freed slaves. So again, uh, when, when you did free slaves, there were still some who remained enslaved, some who worked as indentured servants. Uh, and we, that's where our political, social, and religious systems of classism come into play. That's how, again, you have to create systems within systems in order to uphold uh, a structure of racism and systemic, uh, systemic bias. Uh, so basically, you have an elitist group, an elitist group within the black group, for instance. So that separates some black thinking from other black thinking based on economics. Again, that's where economics is your overarching, overarching uh, principle of capitalism. So you also have military. If you look at the military structure, and, and I am retired military, um, if you look at the military structure, you have officers and enlisted. Um, in terms of freed slaves, they can only be enlisted members of the military, not officers. If you look at that in terms of, uh, in terms of the workplace, that means that they can't be executives. They can only be at the enlisted level or the management level and below. Uh, then in terms of the economy, again, when we, even when we talk about now with all the things going on with, uh, with police brutality, uh, with COVID-19, the, the biggest um, goal or objective of our government at this point is to get the economy moving again. You know, not, not considering the fact that people are dying from COVID-19, that there are no cures for it yet. And by having people in close vicinity of each other, they are elevating the risk of those people dying. Uh, but that's not as important as keeping the economy going. So we have to look at uh, how racism plays into that, how, um, how economics play into that. Uh, and, and, and that alone, uh, those things alone actually help to perpetu perpetuate a racist system and structure. Um, so then uh, lastly, if you look at the box at the bottom, it says belonging. Uh, political correctness and moral sense. Uh, so nowadays, even in the in the workplace, we have um, we had affirmative action that went from affirmative action to diversity. Okay, and it's my own thinking, having worked in civil rights, that 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 was a purposeful change. You know, no one they didn't like affirmative action at first when you had uh, Michigan, the uh, uh, the Michigan. They didn't like the, the fact that affirmative action allowed what they thought was an undereducated black person to come in to get into college when someone who had the economic resources with the same uh, 
educational background should be should have been allowed to go to college first so when you when you talk in terms of political rec, political correctness diversity sounded better than affirmative action because affirmative action was put into play in a legal sense to ensure that minorities had opportunities versus diversity just makes it sound like oh we're being good because we're be we're able to bring in everybody you know different colors this is a you know we are a melting pot you know and and because of that we want to ensure that we look diverse um, however you also notice that diversity uh, and inclusion in most organizations don't have actual policy. It's, most, it's encouraged. Uh, and that's, based, that's encouraged based on the commitment of the leadership without policy. So that's, a, that's an easy way for you to carry out a racist and structural and structured bias uh, without any accountability. Um, next slide, please. So what I, what I wanted to do in the next slide is talk about workplace ad adaptation, which, uh, which is, uh, again, voluntary use of secession plans, for instance. So in some companies, uh, even though secession plans for talent management are put in place, and secession plans, in case you didn't know, are, that's kind of like your, your training success, how you, how you grow from one position to the next, and someone's watching you. So they want to keep you on this profile sheet to be able to manage and help you with your career, help you get to the next step. Well, some people, they have succession plans. However, someone can go through a succession plan, take all of the, the provided training or the recommended training that's there. And then once they get to the selection process, a direct placement comes in and takes that position. So that's what I mean by not being able, not using succession plans, and that's at the that's at the uh, discretion of the organization. So uh, that's how uh, I've noticed that some minorities are no longer placed that are not able to get in strategic leadership positions because those opportunities are taken from them with the by implementing or bringing in a person who is a direct placement that that leader believes could do the job better than the one who has the documented evidence of performance to get there. Um, which makes that a very subjective uh, idea. Uh, then you have affirmative action in diversity plus inclusion. And I put not mutually exclusive there for a reason. So if we have, uh, if we have, when we had affirmative action, it made it more of a policy. It made it something that had to happen. Once it became diversity and inclusion, now you have people who, out, who will weigh diversity against inclusion by making it now sound like inclusion itself is the key However, if you don't have diversity and you're enforcing inclusion, all you're doing is, is forcing a homogeneous group to be inclusive, which still does not help your diversity lens. So again, diversity, diverse leadership is, uh, is uh, something that is good for organizations and there is data that backs that up, data to support that. And that data I would, I would believe would be good data because it does include actual diverse people in that data. Um, Policies, unwritten commitments. So uh, based upon encouragement of goodwill, we see it all the time. We see organizations just recently after the uh, killings of Ahmaud uh, Arbery and the uh, killing of George Floyd, who have come out with these really strong statements that really say nothing. Uh, these statements are, we are obligated to this, we are obligated to that, we are committed to this, and we're gonna offer money to these organizations. The same organizations that are there to, that are arguably there to control the black population rather than to advance them. Uh, and, and when we look at it in the context of when these organizations were created, some of them, they were there to help ensure a, that civil rights and that civil, um, uh, and that civil process and procedure was, was peaceful. Um, and then, of course, the last one is DNR professionals now represented by model minorities. And, and, and that's, that's not a bad thing necessarily, because at this point, I believe that because black people did not create racism. So it's not up to black people to figure out how to fix it. It's up to the system that we've talked about and the structure of that system. However, if black people aren't a part of the solution in your leadership positions, you can't hold those accountable who don't understand or recognize or look over the fact that the problem actually exists. So that's uh, when you have model minorities, and I say that because there's a difference between model minorities and underrepresented minorities. So if you have someone who has not gone through the struggle of racism, the struggle of slavery, then their idea of an actual struggle is not as severe as what actually took place. 
So in other words, they don't believe that reparations, we'll talk about reparations. Well, in my, in my opinion, reparations are get rid of my student debt, you know, get rid of the things that are holding people back from economic wealth and from economic growth, since the economy is the biggest deal in, for, of capitalism. So I just wanted to, uh, to bring those, uh, those ideas into the fold, uh, again, so that many questions can be asked and answered uh, around those. Um, again, these are, these are my own opinions, but these are opinions that I work with in order to help provide solutions for organizations who are, who are trying to figure out and who, can't, who don't have the courage to actually come forward and, and identify their problem. Um, so hopefully these, these items do help you, uh, these considerations help, and, uh, and I look forward to working with these same leaders on this panel uh, in the future to, to help us all try and find a way to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay, uh, Rod, and Carolyn for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from the attendants. So the first question that we have is from Emily. She said that scientific data has been used in favor of racist policy in the past. How can we, how can we be on guard against well-intentioned but biased application of a statistics on race being examined today? Um, so I wanted to uh, first start with Rod, but Jay and Carolyn, if you have thoughts as well regarding this question, please feel free to share. Yeah, this is a great question and is at the heart of what we do, right? Many of us consider ourselves scientists or you know, at least evidence-based. Um, you see that word a lot. Um, and there is definitely the illusion of science is unbiased because it's rational and it's empirical and there's statistics and we will get to the truth incrementally. Um, you know, that's why we see meritocracy in academia is such a popular idea because we are fair and we're, we're scientific. We thought about validity and reliability. Um, so, I mean, it, it, this is a definite danger for us um, to hide behind statistics. And I think it's really important to look at, um, you know, who is doing the research and what is their theoretical stance? Um, what biases are they bringing? Because we are all human and we all have biases. Um, I think we can look at the interpretation of those data um, and whether they are, are, are warranted by the data. Look at the, um, the mass of evidence, right? If we're gonna talk about evidence-based, um, look at the collection of evidence and don't discount the things, don't engage in confirmation bias um, just because you don't like it. Um, look for um, skewed use, like in a lit review, for example, who is being cited and who's not, like what journals, what percent, what perspectives, because um, this can sometimes reveal an intentional bias. Sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes we really just think we're looking at the statistics. So I think at the end of the day, look at the policies or the implications of the findings. If they are being framed or pushed in a way that is anti-humanist, there is a problem. So you might say, well, the data shows African-American students just have lower test scores than white students. That's what the data says. So therefore, something, something, something racism policy. But if you don't, you know, dig past like where are those coming from, like you, if you just take it at face value, it's racist. So, but if the conclusion is anti-humanist, if it is racist, then you need to go back and look at the data. You need to understand why, where in the system is it coming from? So I think that's the defense against, against data and statistics is really questioning how is it being used, where it's coming from, and what other explanations, what are the third, fourth, fifth variables that could explain those results as well? Sorry, the long-winded answer, but that's my take on it. Um, I think Jay has something to say too. Yeah, just a couple of examples actually. Uh, so if you, if you think in terms of data, for instance, medications, if you talk about, if you talk about the efficacy of medications uh, and you look at the fact that medication or drugs that are used 80% by African Americans or by Black people, um, those drugs in the actual qualifi qualification tests that that those drugs that use those drugs used to get approved, they're only five percent of the of the population of the in that study are African Americans. So that data would suggest that that drug is efficacious for those for the rest of the ninety five percent of African Americans when only five percent of them were in the study. To me, that that's skewed data, and it's it's 
it's just one instance where the minority is deemed less important because you because that would be pushed as if it is the end all be all for that particular group, knowing that's not necessarily the case. The other uh, the other place where I'd like to say watch be watchful of data is. Um, when you talk in terms of politics and you talk in terms of policy that is made at our, at our highest levels of government, you have to look at the organizations who are supporting candidates and you have to look at what those candidates' perspectives are with regard to, um, with regard to racist outcomes or racist, uh, uh, the way you handle racism, for instance. So the laws, uh, when, you, when you talk about bills in Congress, you have to understand that one bill, one idea, a bill is not one idea. It's tons of ideas into, into one that's created laws. So when you have one item in that entire bill that is designed to, uh, to push a racist perspective, then you have a racist law that is created without even being recognized. But the data will say that the data won't pick that up. So just wanted to make sure I pointed that out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay and Rod. The second question that we have is, does HFES know whether the diversity task force has been effective by any metrics or measures we agree on? If uh, it has been effective, active since 1994, I would expect to see some evaluation play a role in these goals. Um, so I wanted to start with Caroline, Caroline and uh, see what are her thoughts on, on, on this question. Well, so um, I guess I'm not sure what the metrics or measures are that we agree on. So, you know, I'll, I'll start from that point. Um, it, but what I will say is that um, I, can, I can give you some really good examples of um, what has happened as a direct result of activities undertaken by the diversity task force. So um, in 2014, there was a, basically a, a demographics and climate survey that was done by the, uh, by the task force. And there were about 600 respondents. So it was a really good um, sample of, of uh, members. And I, I think that that really um, lit a fire uh, uh, that, or, or you know, let people see that there were issues there that um, people were experiencing um, some problems at the annual meeting, uh, that, um, that they were finally being able to give some voice to through this survey. Um, and, um, you know, it also, when you do a survey and you start, you know, putting up your graphs and, and you really can visualize what our demographics are, um, you know, you, you really, um, uh, and those are raw statistics that, that really there's no sugarcoating that, um, you know, a, a, a large percentage of our members are older and they're white and they're male. Uh, and so what are, it, it really, you know, forced us to take a look at what are we doing to um, bring in new members uh, who um, are, are diverse in age and gender and um, other characteristics that will keep us a vibrant society. So I think that from that, from that, that effort, from that, from that um, survey, we moved on things like the panels being diverse. So in 2016, um, we had several panels, which were all white men. And, you know, there were a lot of women in the audience going, how come so-and-so isn't up there? Because she's an expert in this. And there were some very dismissive answers to questions. Uh, and I remember we, luckily we had our, um, our, our session for the diversity and uh, task force, the, the session that they arranged at the meeting was after all this. And there, there was a lot of really excellent discussion in there. And then some action came out of that, including that when you are as a chair of a program, you see um, these panel um, uh, 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 proposals coming through, 
you want to talk with the people and make sure that they've really got a, a diverse panel there. That's just one example, but I think more equally important, maybe more important, is the strategic goal. Um, the, the strategic goal on diversity, um, that, that also came directly out of recognizing that this is a priority for us, but you don't see it anywhere. It isn't written anywhere, it isn't documented anywhere, and if it's not written down, then it's not gonna get any action. So um, the EC in 2017 um, at the mid-year meeting uh, uh, wrote, uh, developed and approved that new strategic goal. Um, and so I think then after that's in place, then again, the, the task force becomes a committee which recognizes that it's not just a year to year thing, but it's permanent. It goes up to the executive council level, recognizing that now we're accountable to the executive council for, um, for what we're doing. Um, and um, so, and, and again, we have programming every year. Is there, what can you measure from programming at the annual meeting? You can measure that you have increasing numbers of attendees, which we do. Um, what they do with the information that they get, that's not so measurable. It's not necessarily documented that I got inspired because I went to this session at the annual meeting and I went off and decided to change my topic of my thesis or give this a different um, uh, direction for it. Those are just some examples. So. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, the other question we have is from Stacy. Um, I'm a usability professional who often faces challenges in the recruitment of diverse participants in my work. What methods of rec or recommendations are there for widening the net to include more diverse participation? Traditionally, diverse users are not signing up. Where do we go to get them? Um, does any of uh, you want to respond to this question? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give some input on that. Uh, so working in talent management uh, and talent acquisitions, one of the things I noticed is uh, whether it's executive recruiters or whether it's the regular recruiting, they don't have many databases of, of outreach to minority uh, communities. So you gotta be intentional about that first. You have to find uh, organizations that actually support the professional development of the group that you're looking to help uh, bring forward. So, uh, for instance, if it's a disability group or if it's a, or if it is a, a minority group, for instance, I'll give you an example, the American Bar Association, there's also a National Bar Association. The National Bar Association works with the professional development of minorities almost exclusively. So if you really are looking for minority lawyers to apply for a position, why not reach out to them and send the requisitions directly to that organization for dissemination to their, to their membership? So it's things like that that you have to be intentional about. Everybody's not going to come to you. You've got to be some, you've got to reach out and do your outreach to them. That's Thank the equity you. part of it. I agree um, that it is very, it's an intentional recruiting. It's purposeful. Um, some people like research and they volunteer um, because they've heard about research and they trust it. Um, but when you're looking at marginalized communities, um, more effort may be needed to build that trust. Um, it's like, otherwise it's like, you're coming to me for my numbers, my data, like what do you do, what are you gonna do with it? Is it secure? Um, I don't know you. Um, and I think building that trust so that people know what you're doing and why, why you value them um, is really important. So you not only go out and intentionally seek and intentionally recruit, but intentionally build trust so that people know what you're doing and why, and they can have faith in your work. Because a lot of marginalized communities um, have been guinea pigs, right? We've, we've been the recipients of research, or we've had research inflicted on us, as opposed to being participants or contributors in it. And recognizing a little bit of that history um, might really help to build a, a better rapport. Um, because the idea of bringing more people, representing more people in your samples is, is amazing. That is what we need to be doing. That is a great goal, but it but it's challenging. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question in the chat that I would like to ask. Uh, it says, like many societies, the dues are fairly substantial. 
do these inhibit having a more diverse member base? For example, younger professionals I know do not perceive value to membership given the cost. Uh, so does anyone uh, want to reply to this question? <clears throat> I mean, that's why affinity groups are so good. Uh, that's why business resource groups are good. Um, if, if you provide an avenue for employees to be engaged with one another, and, and that's uh, all, all different employees from all groups, um, and share with each other the, the, uh, the, the intersectionalities, so, so to speak, or how, how every, every aspect of the business impacts them differently then I think that you could, you could help close that gap. You could get those employees uh, in, play, in a place where they're more comfortable uh, becoming members because now they know that they have something that's going to impact their career. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure, please, Rod. I was gonna say, I can imagine um, some HFES leader folks are saying, are hearing like the dues are too high and they're thinking, oh no, budget. We need that money to run, and it's true. Societies need income to stay to stay in business. It's a business, and I think exactly what Jay is saying is, let's make sure the value is there, so that when people join, they come to HFES and they're just blown away by how valuable it is now and throughout their careers, how accepted and welcome they are now and throughout their careers, and so that when a person joins, they have found their home as opposed to what I think some of our students do is they join for a year, they apply for a bunch of jobs, they get a job, and then they let their membership lapse because that's what HFES did for them, is it got them in the foot, their foot in the door for interviews. And I think thinking about how to make every dollar valuable for members and for diverse members and more members is what will keep people coming in and staying. Thank you very much, our panelists, uh, Carolyn, Rod, and Jay. Uh, I will also want to thank you uh, for participating in this webinar, and I hope that uh, we as HFES members can contribute to make things better. Um, I just wanted to close to say that be kind to one another and uh, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Miriam. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Jay. Thank you.